Hi there, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Mark Esper, uh, Secretary of Defense from 2019 to 2020. Before that, Secretary of the Army. Way before that, a uh, West Point graduate, a, a combat veteran of the first Gulf War, an infantry officer, uh, distinguished career. And this is when I got to, we got to know each other, Mark, uh, in the, both the exec, when you were in the executive branch, you were on the senior positions on the Hill, uh, private sector. And then you ended up as Secretary of the Army and Secretary of Defense under President Trump and served honorably. We can get back to that and uh, there. And we're, you were relieved of your duties there right after the election, which for me was a huge alarm bell. Well, honestly, I thought, my God, if President is moving Mark Esper, nothing good is going to happen at the Defense Department for those final two months. But anyway, I, 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 I know a good story there, too. Yeah, yeah, I do. Right. I, I, I was in a like a simulation in the summer of 2020. What could go wrong on after Election Day? And I said, you know, I was playing Trump, President Trump. And I said, I think I'll just remove my secretary of defense. I think I also removed Bill Barr just to have those two agencies a little more under my direct control without the kinds of limits that you and uh, Bill Barr would the kinds of things you would not do that he might want to do. And uh, everyone said on the, this was on Zoom, it was during the pandemic. Everyone said, oh, Bill, that's, it's imaginative of you. You know, of course that'll never happen. But I mean, that was kind of clever of you to think of that, you know? So there you, there you go. Anyway, Mark, thanks for joining me. And, uh, and thank you for your service, honestly, to the nation. So. No, thank you. My privilege. And, uh, and I noticed in quickly researching your, uh, the, your career and the, you were confirmed as secretary of defense, 90 to eight, uh, that's impressive. That doesn't happen all the time these days. Yeah, not uh, not bad for my third year. I, I remember uh, President Trump saying, uh, and I write about this on book, my book, he said, uh, yeah, 90 to 8, 98, 98. Should I be concerned that you got that many votes from <laughs> Republicans and Democrats? And I, yeah. and I just looked at him and smiled. Yeah, that was that's probably wise. A lot of them knew you. Right? You had served in senior positions in the Bush administration and then on the right. Hill for Senator Frist and stuff. So that was a, just a tribute actually to you that, that did it. The book, A Sacred Oath, people should, from 2022, I think, people should read that. A really important, I think, chronicle of the Trump years and of the actual substance of the policy decisions, as well as some of the drama and all that. But we can get back to that. I want to, let's talk, let's begin in the present. Uh, we're at a very important moment. We're speaking on, what is it, Wednesday, April 17th. A uh, big debate on the Hill uh, about aid for Ukraine, which has been delayed for a while. I mean, this is an issue you worked on a lot, both for over the years and decades, but certainly as Secretary of Defense, NATO, Ukraine, Russia. Why should? Why does it matter? I mean, why? How important is it? Is it really, really fundamentally important? Is it? You know, g g give me your take on this. Well, look, I, the bottom line is I do think it's very important, and and why is that? I, I go back to the basics, right? When I came into office as Secretary of Defense, I said that my top priority would be implementing the national defense strategy. And the, um, the, the core assumption of the national defense strategy was we're now in this era of great power competition where our adversaries were no longer uh, you know, terrorist groups and um, insurgencies. They would still be there. But our number one concern should be China, then Russia. That's how I prioritize them. And that we would face an era where uh, both countries would become far more aggressive. And at that point in time, as, as you know, uh, Russia had already invaded uh, Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine in 2014. So I, I began um, my tenure uh, doing a number of things, reviewing our war plans with regard, with regard to both countries, um, at trying to support our allies, moving troops to Europe, moving forces to Europe, because, you know, my view was it was only a matter of time. And unfortunately, we were proven right. You know, Pre uh, President Putin, Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine trying to seize Kiev in a matter of days in what, February of 22. And now we've been fighting. They've been fighting for two plus years now. So it's, it's very, very real. And it matters because it, we're really in an era of the autocracies versus the democracies. And the democracies are led, should be led by the United States of America. And the autocracies are led by Beijing and Moscow. And uh, we're back to where we were when I entered uh, uh, West Point in 20, in 1982, we're back in a pseudo Cold War with these major powers. And so I think it's time for us to really uh, take on the mantle of leadership. Uh, what President Ronald Reagan, I, I consider myself a, a Reagan Republican, what he charged us all to do. And he and President George H.W. Bush eventually won the Cold War through that type of leadership. I think we need to get back to that. Yeah, and I mean, Putin, it's in a way, it's not worse than the Cold War, because obviously that was a nuclear showdown between us and the Soviet Union, and Russia's, a little, Russia's different, but uh, the direct invasion of a neighbor, that was pretty, the Soviets preserved their Warsaw Pact, I guess they invaded their Warsaw Pact, quote, allies to keep them in the, in the pact, 
But well, they, they, didn't they own really, Ukraine then. <laughs> what's that? They held Ukraine, yeah. But the, yeah. the actual direct invasion of a UN member state uh, with the kind of semi-genocidal way they've conducted the war, maybe not semi, uh, it's pretty the largest ground war in Europe in 80 years, I think. Right. I mean, it's pretty it's, I feel it's pretty big. Mo- I think don't you think February 24th, 2022 will be like a, a moment in 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 real genuine moment in, in world history? Yeah, look, I think it crystallized, again, this notion of uh, a new era of great power competition with Russia and China being the adversaries. And keep in mind, it was just a few weeks before uh, the invasion that uh, uh, Putin and Xi Jinping, uh, the president of China, should stood side by side of all places uh, in Beijing at the Olympics. And, uh, you, know, you know, they issued their 5000 word uh, statement about their strategic partnership and alliance. And would it just be a few weeks later when Russia would invade um, Ukraine with armored columns and mechanized troops? And, you know, it, 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 it was almost like, you know, the. <laughs> The, the, the Nazi invasion of Poland in 39. I mean, it was just a, kind of a blitz into Kiev. And fortunately, the Ukrainians fought back bravely, uh, courageously and competently and and um, and uh, spoiled their plans. Good for them. And, and you all did, I think, a fair amount. And maybe the preceding administration had begun after 2014 to do some things too to really build up Ukraine's military capability. I think that's under, I think that's right. That seems like it's underappreciated, actually. Yeah, we did a number of things. And, you know, we're, I know you eventually want to talk about the Trump administration. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, the Trump administration did well was approved uh, 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 providing javelins, for example, javelin anti-tank missiles for Ukraine. Uh, that came in very effective uh, when the Russians invaded a few years later. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we did a lot of training trying to bring Ukraine up to NATO standards. Uh, we had U.S. forces, NATO forces there. I actually went to the, the uh, city of Lviv in Western Ukraine, where, where we were training them, spent a couple of days on the ground, talking to the Ukrainians, talking to our people. Uh, so it was a great effort. And uh, I, I believe as much as the weapons, training the Ukrainians to NATO standards, NATO tactics and techniques, uh, when they would eventually go against a Russian army still using Soviet bloc uh, tactics, really made a, a big difference in the initial days of the war. Yeah, that's interesting. And you had a president who was famously skeptical of NATO. You had a foreign policy establishment that was also a little bit tired, maybe, of NATO. That seemed like something from another era. Uh, but you, I think, always put a priority on it, didn't you, as SecDef and, 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 and throughout your career, I think. And I think that turned out to be right. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I learned early on that uh, allies and partners matter. They're the great asymmetric advantage that the United States has. You know, we, we have dozens of allies and partners, b- being both former legal uh, treaty partners and uh, allies and others who are just partners. And when you look at who the other team has, the other team being Russia and China, their lineup looks like this. Uh, North Korea, Sur- uh, Syria, Mali, Venezuela. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not Iran, a good lineup. Iran, we have a far Iran. better team. And so we have to... It, it, we have to keep them together. We have to uh, train with them, uh, make sure that they're interoperable. Um, and of course, I served for a few years in Europe as an army officer in NATO. So I, I appreciate the alliance from that perspective. But look, I was also willing to be critical uh, and still am about our NATO allies not spending enough on defense and uh, not doing more to make sure that they're combat ready. Because if you're truly combat ready, effective, there's there's no greater deterrent uh, than, and to, than to have that capability. I guess Iran would be the other country that's part of the alliance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, and pretty uh, important, it turns out, right, in terms of what they can provide and, uh, and the drones and stuff. Yeah, no, it's really a, really evolved, uh, accelerated over the past couple of years. Uh, they're not, a, they're not, uh, they're subordinate, but not like a third tier player here that that maybe Mali or Nicaragua mm-hmm. is or Cuba. I mean, they really are have become a a, a a industrial base, at least for Russia, in terms of providing drones and missiles. And items like that, we know North Korea is doing the same. So we're seeing a degree of cooperation between these countries that we've never seen before. And, and, and we should be concerned about that. I'm just, I think people would be interested, just uh, people haven't served in the Pentagon, as you have, certainly not at your levels. Um, Secretary of Army, Secretary of Defense, I mean, what would, I don't know, what was your day like as Secretary of Defense? If I could just divert to that for a few minutes, and then we'll get to some of the substantive issues about uh, both the past and the future. But um, I mean, uh, people don't have a... Sense, I, th- I mean, it's such a massive enterprise. I even, I don't know, I've served in the executive right. branch, obviously, but yeah, I don't even quite have a sense of what you do. It. What, what would you, how do you think about even being SECDEF, you know? Well, for some biographical information to kind of set the, set the stage, you know, I, I spent, uh, went to West Point, spent uh, 
uh, 21 years in the Army, 10 on active duty, 11 in the Guard and Reserve. And then, as you mentioned earlier, I, I did my time on the Hill and then served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense during the George W. Bush administration. So when you trace back the individual steps, I'd actually served in the Pentagon five times total. So I knew my way around the building from various different perspectives as an Army officer, as a as a, a mid-level civilian appointee, and eventually as Secretary of the Army and Secretary of Defense. And so I kind of knew the pace and how it worked. And and uh, how to kind of pull the levers. But uh, look, a standard day um, is uh, not unlike, you know, a CEO's day, if you will. I'd, I'd get in there early after going to the gym, early being at 730. And, you know, you, the first thing you typically do is read intelligence, catch up on what happened the night before, and then a series of meetings. And depending on, on the day of the week, it would be anything from, again, reviewing war plans to um, uh, re- reviewing or looking at what some members of Congress are concerned about. It might be White House meetings on a pending policy choice dealing with, you know, NATO or Iran or something like that. But the day usually runs pretty long. Uh, I, I used to try and wrap up by 6 p.m. because I knew that I, I could stay longer, but there were hundreds of people waiting for me to leave that had to do the cleanup work, the, the, the administrative stuff after I left. I, I, I learned that years earlier as a captain in the Ar- on the Army staff at the Pentagon. And so I tried to get out of there every day by 6. I'd carry a big bag of work home. I'd get home, eat dinner, and I would read and write and 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 sign memos uh, for the next two hours. So it was a long day, and it would extend to the weekends. But look, that's the nature of public service. I'm sure Lloyd Austin is going through that now, and my predecessors did also. You throw on top of that foreign travel because a big part of the Secretary of Defense's job, unlike the service secretaries, which which I was Secretary of the Army, is there's a big foreign policy dynamic, uh, and that means going over and meeting. Um, not not just your counterparts in in countries, but also the heads of state, the prime ministers. And so uh, that was a big part of the job that often gets overlooked. And you really have to balance that out because we do have a secretary of state who that's that's his primary job, exclusive job. So foreign policy is a big part of it. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, trying to answer the media, talk to the media, uh, uh, think tank appearances to talk about policy issues, all those things kind of get factored in. So it's it's quite a task. It's a there's a big staff that kind of help make you successful. But um, uh, it, you know the the great thing about the Pentagon, it's staffed by so many wonderful people who are committed to the nation's defense, and that makes long days all the more easier. Yeah, I mean, even I, when I came to Washington, my first job at the Education Department, tiny, tiny, tiny compared to the Pentagon, and I was Bill Bennett's assistant and the chief of staff. I guess I had not appreciate. I studied politics. I taught at the Kennedy School. I didn't really appreciate what it was to try to run a department deal with the Hill, which has, you know, legitimate oversight and then annoying oversight <laughs> of one's own, of, of, of everything you're doing. And and that meant dealing individually with members and of course, testifying and, and that kind of thing. Dealing with the media, dealing in your case with foreign governments, dealing with the interagency process, which is extremely complex and time consuming and both formal and informal, you can say a word about that, you know, at the, at the, at your level, the cabinet level with secretary of state and intelligence agencies, everyone. I mean, it's just so many different spokes. I think that's a little different. CEOs have some of that, but it's the, the kind of all these different actors who have legitimate claims on your attention. It's not that they're just, you know, that, that part I, I remember just hadn't fully appreciated until I got to Washington. Yeah, I, I think there, that is a striking difference with a CEO or the head of any kind of company or association is there are so many stakeholders, you know, up and down the chain of command, uh, you know, externally, it's, you know, I mentioned think tanks and associations and members of Congress and, and, and labor unions and, uh, you know, companies who are part of the defense industrial base and venture firms, uh, you know, what I'm doing now. I mean, all these people are in that system and you have to figure out, you know, how do you allocate your time? It's the most precious thing you have is allocating your time to uh, to hear about an issue, to try and solve a problem and, uh, and do so in a way that gives you the greatest uh, return on investment. And that is how you think about every day. And then on top of that, you have the things that just happen out of the blue. You know, I describe in my my memoir how I had returned from a meeting and um, was trying to catch up on some things. And next thing I know, my chief of staff burst into the room. You know, I, I just thought it was kind of some in, internal issue that popped up or the White House was calling. But you know, he pops into the room and says, Secretary, we, you know, we, we need to get you to the to, to the command post or to this office very quickly because we we have a civilian airline or a civilian plane that's in the national defense airspace and we can't contact it. And you may have to shoot it down in the next three or four minutes. And, you know, that'll get your attention pretty quickly, Bill. And, uh, yeah. you know, fortunately, we, re- we rehearse these things and 
we were able to solve it. But it's just stuff like that that no CEO is going to have to deal with or anybody for that matter. Uh, but that's what you have to be prepared for. And those, and that was not uh, you know, unique. That happened more than once on my watch. And other things happen as well that just pop up in the news. So more often than not, you're you're addressing problems and putting out fires. Um, and, and that's that's the nature of the job, though, right? The tough things get pushed up. And that's that's what you accept when you take these jobs. I'm curious, just maybe one last question about the Pentagon in general. I mean, we're on the spectrum of it's a pretty amazing machine that has very good people working there, as you said, both civilian and military, has figured out how to do an awful lot of things over the years and decades and it needs competent management, God knows, and sound policy direction uh, and ethical policy direction and so forth. But it it's sort of well, it, it, it runs well to the other side of this argument, which is, you know, serious people make something, it needs pretty big reform. It's stuck in, it's very slow, slow to change. It procures weapons that would have been useful 15 years ago. It's hard to, you know, uh, hard to shake things up. What's the sort of balance of truth between those two poles? Yeah, look, the answer in some ways is both. Look, it's it's all staffed by great people, both military and civilian alike. They're all committed. They spend long hours at the job um, and, uh, you know, do some extraordinary things. And but when you go back a step to our what we're just talking about, because there are so many stakeholders, there are uh, offices covering each one of those stakeholders and their issues. So my my staff, my office of the secretary of defense staff was numbered in the thousands. And so uh, but you need that type of process that kind of staff to make sure that you've checked every box, answered any question. And I think generally they produce very good options and solutions, but be, because it's be, because they're so thorough and it's so big, it takes time, which is good when you're thinking about long-term important decisions that, that you have time to think about. But if, but if it's something, if you're in a crisis or you need speed, it's not as adept at that. And so in some ways we're too slow. Uh, and, and that problem, in, in, in some ways, is dictated by Congress when you talk about weapons procurement, because while the Pentagon can make a decision to buy a new weapon, um, it, it still takes 18 to 24 months to program it, to put it into your budget proposal, to send that budget proposal to the Hill. And then Congress you know, considers it for a year and then finally passes you know, an authorization bill and, appropri- and an appropriations bill. But again, you're talking about two years to bring something Uh, to just approve the funding for it, let alone kind of start up production and everything. And that is the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges we face these days. And it's been exposed by the war in uh, Ukraine and exacerbated uh, uh, by what's happening in in the Middle East, that we just simply can't keep pace uh, on the production of arms and ammunition that we need for not just these conflicts, but for, God forbid, a future one with China. Yeah, how worried are you about that? I mean, uh, our friend Eric Adelman, I've done a couple, several conversations with him, and he's it's, he made the same point you just did that particularly the everyone assumes we can just we just we should appropriate the money and we should not have political problems with that. But even if we do, it's not as if our defense industrial base is all the way where it should be in terms of producing what we need to produce, and of course our allies isn't either. How how worried? How much of a priority should that be? Building up a really serious. Uh, defense industrial base and also technology base that's within the country or whether we have very sure access to in terms of future challenges? Well, let's go back to the threat first. You know, I don't think a conflict with China is imminent and it's not necessarily inevitable. But if the trend lines continue, if if the Chinese communi- uh, co- uh, economy continues to suffer, if Xi Jinping thinks that he's losing control of the country, maybe he'll try and do something. Maybe he'll just try to do something with Taiwan because he wants it to be part of his legacy. And we know that he wants to be in the pantheon of great Chinese leaders like Mao. So you have to, you have to plan prudently. Uh, now, when you get to our side of things, again, uh, the Pentagon can certainly do more to move quickly. But in this case, uh, I put a lot of it on Congress. You, you know, I think the, if we go back to corporate America, there, 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 none of the um, handcuffs that are placed on a, a CEO that, that uh, DOD faces, you know, a CEO can can shift directions pretty quickly with using his or her corporate money to, to invest in something new or to explore an innovation or increase production. We don't have that flexibility at DOD. Any, you know, for some small amounts of money you do, but for really making a material difference, you have to go back to Congress and get approval by, you know, four different committees. And it's a long, laborious process. And then there's the annual allocation of funds. And Congress is very reluctant to do what's called multi-year uh, funding and, and and you know for corporate America for the defense industrial base, you know if you th- really think you need, if I believe we need to increase production to do that, in some cases you need to 
double or triple shifts, or you need to build a new production line, or maybe even a new factory. But a, but a defense company is not going to do that unless they can see a steady stream of um, revenue coming in based on sales that stretches in the years because you got to pay that off. And we're just not giving the, giving corporate America that degree of predictability and uh, clarity on on funding. So we really got got to get that fixed because look, if we get into a shooting war uh, with China, we're going to expend a lot of ammunition, a lot of uh, weapons very, very quickly. And, and so will they. Uh, the difference is <laughs> they have a very large manufacturing base. The Chinese Communist Party can move on a dime. It can pivot on a dime. And they'll be able to do things, I'm afraid, more quickly than we can. And then the question is, who can rebuild, refit, rearm real quick and, and, and go back at it again? And that's where I get very concerned. So I think you know we need to build a, a better, a quicker a, a defense industrial base. We need to we need to start stockpiling arms and ammunition, and we need our allies to do it the same. Not just our European allies, but our Indo Pacific allies as well. Yeah, and I guess the Ukraine war suggests that it's not just even if we don't get directly into a shooting war, if we're supplying an ally who's fighting an adversary, there too the strains can show up pretty quickly, right? It's been two years, which is a heck of a long time if you're in Ukraine and the suffering they've gone through and all that. But on the other hand, it's you know it could go on for longer, and other things could pop up elsewhere, as we saw in the Middle East. And yeah, I do feel like people just aren't, I don't know, how much do you think people in foreign policy, defense policy world have pivoted to this new world that we're in? The superpower competition, people use that phrase, but really the integrated or the the way in which Russia and China help each other, Iran helps them both. Uh, who knows how much real coordination there is, but at least there's opportunistic, I'd say, coordination and taking advantage of things. I sort of feel like we're part way to coming to grips with this new moment, but still a little bit living in the 2000s or 2010s, you know? Yeah, I, I think we could we could really use a greater sense of urgency in Washington about about these matters, again, within the Pentagon and certainly on Capitol Hill. I, I mean, look, we're, we're Congress has been dithering for months now with regard to this latest spending package for Ukraine, which also includes, uh, by the way, Israel, Taiwan, etc. So there's that. Uh, I think we should up our game there. But more more puzzlingly is is Europe. I mean, they have Russia invading a neighboring country right on their doorstep. Doorstep, and if you look at all now thirty two allies, some are really doing a great job. They've increased their defense spending uh, uh, significantly. Poland, for example, is above four percent. Right. You have some of the the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, who are have high levels of defense spending and who are contributing as a percent of GDP more than the United States is uh, to the Ukrainian war effort. But then you look at other parts of the alliance, those countries that are further away from Russia, and you just see no change. I mean, even Canada is you know, still spending 1.2% of its GDP on defense. I mean, everybody in the alliance, but particularly the European countries who are nearby, you would think they'd be far more alarmed and, and uh, increasing rapidly their defense budgets to, to really meet the threat. This is where I give... Uh, um, Japan credit. I think Prime Minister Kishida uh, a couple of years ago uh, announced that uh, Japan would double its defense spending from 1% to 2%. And you think about a 1% increase for a country that's the fourth largest economy in the world, that's a big increase. And plus they made decisions to uh, acquire counter-strike uh, land attack cruise missiles. Big change from where their constitutional foundations have been with regard to these matters. So you see some company countries taking it very, very seriously and you see others not so. And I think we all need to have that collective sense that uh, we are in a new era. We're going to have to get back to higher levels of defense spending, no matter you, you know, no, no matter if we would prefer otherwise. And America and a few countries just can't ca carry all this weight. The voters just will not will not suffer that. And I think you know we'll talk about that. I, you'll see Trump tapping into that 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 notion as well. Yeah, I mean, they need to do more, but they can't really ultimately do it without us either. So it's a that's right. We need both. To, I mean, the Japanese prime minister was kind of remarkable when he was here. Again, it wasn't commented on that much. He spoke to Congress, but I'd say he did stress the importance of winning in Ukraine or they were defeating Putin. I mean, that's from the Asia. Some of the China hawks want to distinguish Asia from Europe, and we should just focus on Asia and let Europe kind of fall apart. He, he rejected that pretty strongly, and, and he didn't have to, so to speak. He was speaking to the U.S. Congress, and he really wanted to make that point. The other thing is, you know better than I, I mean, going from 1% to 2% doesn't sound like that much in a funny way, but for them, psychologically, that's a huge jump, Absolutely. isn't it? That 1% has been kind of a pacifist Japan, post-World War II thing that's for right. 80 years. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's more than just a number. It is a psychological threshold. It's a, it's a different footing, and it's sending a message, you know. <laughs> 
I, I mean, who, who else are they making that announcement about? It's, it's uh, clearly North Korea is a threat to them, but they've been dealing with North Korea for, for decades. It's really about China. Yeah. And it's about China, Chinese Coast Guard, Chinese naval vessels in Japanese waters, in Japanese, uh, you know, exclusive economic zones, uh, sailing around the Senkakus, which the Japanese administer. I, I think the Japanese recognizes. And uh, and by the way, it's not just them who are saying fun Ukraine. It's Taiwan, too, is saying because they, they recognize the, the common principle at stake here. And the common principle is this. If a big authoritarian neighbor invades a smaller democracy uh, for, for the sole purpose of seizing that territory and, and incorporating it into their own domain. We need to fight for those principles or else, you know, the, the global order that we've known that's produced, produ uh, you know, peace and prosperity, prosperity for the last 75 plus years is going to is going to wither away. And that's not the world we want to live in when we're living under Chinese values and Chinese interests. Uh, it'll be a far different world for our grandchildren and great grandchildren. Or a world in which Putin could just invade a neighbor and slaughter people and then get away with sure. it or keep a good chunk of the of the, the territory or all of it. Yeah. I mean, after World War II, we said never again, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just to transition to, to President Trump a little bit, I mean, you, you've eloquently articulated this view that I certainly agree with. And the president doesn't really quite agree with that in terms of the importance of the post-World War, post War II global order, U.S. centrality, importance of the allies. I mean, you've worked with him closely and you, as I say, I think helped him do some good things and stopped him from doing some things he shouldn't have done. But what um, in foreign policy, I guess, what I mean, what would a Trump second term look like in your view? And, and I guess, especially given the centrality of Ukraine and NATO. Well, I, look, I think you have to take uh, President Trump and any leader for that matter uh, at their word. And, and Trump has been explicit with regard to what he would do. You know, with Ukraine, he said he cut off funding, cut off support, and uh, he would negotiate an agreement within 24 hours. Yeah, what is which, that? <laughs> which is fanciful. The only person who could stop this war in 24 hours is Vladimir Putin. Um, so, but but he's also, uh, you know, attacked uh, you, uh, NATO, uh, you know, said it's not a good deal for the United States and, you know, had made attempts during his first term to um, uh, to to undermine the alliance. So, well, look, I take him at, at face value for what his view on, on those. He said similar things about our allies in um, in Asia. So, um I think he would pursue those things in the second term because he's unbound by the need to kind of play to a reelection because there will no there will no be there will not be another term after that. And so then the other big question becomes, who does he put in his cabinet? You know, right. uh, myself and Mike Pompeo and, and John Bolton would talk him out of these things uh, or times when it came to funding Ukraine, trying to talk him into providing funding for Ukraine. So, uh, you know, keep part here is one him, but the opposite side of the coin are who are the people he brings around him uh, at both the departments of state, uh, defense and elsewhere, but also in the White House, because the people there have a big influence on him as well. So those are unknowns that uh, we should be concerned about as this uh, election unfolds. They're unknowns, but my feeling is the, the odds are pretty good that it would tip much more to the kinds of people he put in after you left and after John Bolton left and after uh, Bill Barr left even, you know, in justice, uh, as opposed to, to you guys, in a sense. I think he thinks you and he said this, right, that you all constrained him and didn't let him really, you know, pursue the America first agenda and all that. Yeah, look, he's loyalty will be the number one attribute. Uh, and look, he, w when you take these jobs, there, there is a degree of loyalty, support of the president. Uh, that comes with it, but it's not unconditional. It's not un unqualified, right? Your first loyalty is to the Constitution, to the American people, which is kind of how I, 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 I drew my lines. Uh, so, but I think his uh, his standard is loyalty lo loyalty to him, no matter what, no matter the issue. And so, the question will be: Is who does he bring in? And if that's the type of people they are, what is going to bind them? You know, at least in the military, you have a professional military class understands what. Its ethics are what the norms are, the proper behavior between civilians and the military, and I, I think they will hold the line. But uh, the civilian secretary of defense has a lot of power. I've tried to emphasize this multiple times. You know, there's only two people in, in the United States of America that can deploy United States forces: the president and the secretary of defense. Uh, not the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not the vice president. Uh, it, it, it's only the president and the secretary of defense. So it's it's an immensely powerful position. And there's other things that come with that uh, responsibility, too. So these decisions on personnel will be very, very important. And that's that should concern us again. 
Yeah, and I think you were alarmed as, as I was when you were relieved and the kinds of people that President Trump wanted to bring in there and some of whom he did bring in, some of whom maybe there was enough pushback that he couldn't quite do what he wanted to do. But uh, you signed that letter on the very beginning of January of 2021, uh, reminding, I guess, all living former secretaries of defense did, right? And reminding yeah. reminding everyone that uh, the military could not be used for political ends and so forth. I'll talk a little bit about that. I was very, I was very struck by that. And I thought, man, if, if Mark Esper and Dick Cheney and people like that or Bob Gates are signing a letter like this, they're alarmed. And if they're alarmed, I'm alarmed. It wouldn't, it's not the kind of thing you just do easily, you know? Yeah, no, I think it was January 4th uh, that, that we, we wrote that piece. We agreed on it. I, I had a hand in editing it and writing it. Uh, and it was remarkable that you had all of us sign on, the eight or nine at the time, um, probably the first time ever, all uh, living secretaries of defense from both parties, by the way, right? So it was, right. you know, my, myself and Bill Cohen and Bob Gates and Leon Panetta. I mean, the whole, it ran the whole gamut, Republicans de and Democrats and Republicans who work for Democrats. And so, but I think one thing we all share is we, we know that there's a responsibility that comes with being secretary of defense and for running the Pentagon that says, you are going to be apolitical um, to, to, the, to the degree that, you, you know, where it matters, uh, certainly for sure. And so there's this sense of apolitical and your responsibility and staying out of politics, particularly for the, the military. And so that's kind of what brought us together, particularly as we saw in things full, as, as things unfolded and as the election denialism continued, there was a growing concern that would the military get involved? And we all know now that there was that, I guess, a meeting in late December with, uh, I think maybe it was Mike Flynn and others who said, yeah, maybe we should send the, the, you know, the military in to see to seize uh, ballot boxes or to conduct another election. I can't recall the details, but it was quite alarming that, you know, the military would be put in that context. I was concerned going into the fall that the military would be used um, at, at the time of the election, you know, when the results were revealed to, to uh, put down protests, uh, to do other things. And so that became more of my concern, immediate concern at that point in time. And of course, I don't think anybody envisioned that the, the weeks and months after uh, November 2020 would, would, would happen the way they did. I mean, I, in my lifetime, if you had told me 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that there would be an insurrection on Capitol Hill and people would storm the Capitol and, and try and seize ballot boxes and threaten to hang Mike Pence, the vice president, you, it would be like a, a bad Hollywood movie, right? But it, it was real and, and it should be a wake-up call for all of us. Well, to your credit, and you, you discussed this in the book at some length, you used to, in the summer, spring, summer of 2020, you decided, I think, in certain red lines that you needed to really be careful about not just observing yourself, of course, you observed it yourself, but making sure that the Defense Department was not misused, that the military was not used inappropriately, that it wasn't politicized. And, and you, so you, I, I don't know, you, you were, yeah, you, everyone was surprised, of course, by January 6th, but you were, you were aware of the dangers, I'd say, of what might happen. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, that what we, I end up calling them the four no's, right? As, as you said, no, it was no politicization of the military, no strategic retreats, uh, no misuse of, of the military. And uh, of course, the fourth one would, would fleet from my mind. No was, aggressive war, no. Yeah, wars, no unnecessary okay. wars, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, because there were people within the administration in the year of 2020 who were, you know, for one reason or another, the national security advisor wanted to, you know, go after Iran or go after Venezuela or do this or do that. And, uh, you know, skipping over di diplomacy and sanctions and everything else that might happen to use the military. And I was very concerned about us being used in that, us being DOD being used in that way, but also uh, with, with not looking at other options, but also as a political tool. And, and so, so there was that. And, you, you know, what what um, what uh, happened at Lafayette Park, uh, you know, Mark Milley and I were, were, were duped, but it was, look, we should have had better political antennae. We recalibrated at that point, and that's where we came up with the four no's. And we said, we, you know, I said, wow. I got to get to the election. Um, my, my timeline was get to the election. My uh, my red lines were the four no's. And my strategy was to play uh, play defense on the outside and offense on the inside. So offense on the inside meant within DOD, within the Pentagon, I wanted to keep forward moving all the initiatives I had underway to modernize the military, to focus on China, uh, to improve the lives of our service members, go as hard as I could, play offense for the next six or seven months. But outside the Pentagon, be in a far more defensive stance, be far more calibrated to people trying to use DOD for political reasons. And so that became my strategy. And then my goal eventually became, gotta get to the election. Get, get to the election, 
uh, and, and let the American people make the choice. And whatever happens after that, I can't didn't think I would be able to hold on any longer. And I was largely correct in that estimation. I think you wrote your resignation letter before the president tweeted that you were got, that you were you were going to be removed, right? And, well, you so. know, I I, I had I, I did have the the outlines of one, but uh, you know, I, my view was, um, and it was actually tempered by folks. You know, I talked a lot with 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 uh, Bob Gates and Leon Panetta and other other predecessors, Colin Powell, and you know, at these very difficult times in the summer of 2020. You know, because you want to get advice from people who are in those positions, who held those jobs, who kind of can give you the best, um, the, the best recommendations because they've been there, but also have the advantage of being uh, from the outside looking in. And to a person, to a man, they said, no, nope, don't resign. Uh, because that was my inclination. It was Mark Milley's inclination. They said, make him fire you. Uh, do what you need to do. Make him fire you. And that's the way to hold on and, 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 and you know, kind of execute your strategy. And uh, I did follow that and it, it was the right way to go. And, um, I so. and so I, I actually did not intend to resign, uh, but I did want to have something ready in case I was, in case I was asked to make a, dis, to do something that I thought was, you know, immoral or illegal or something like that. And there was no other way out of it. I would have to resign. I say a word, right? I mean, I think people don't understand fully how the secretary of defense, the chairman of the joint chiefs, the civil military relations side of it. I mean, you and general Milley, Worked very closely together on on these kinds of things, as well as many other things, I'm sure. But the SecDef is, and people have great faith in the military, which I think is good and mostly justified. But the civilian leadership matters, right? I mean, it also affects who the military leadership is, since the civilian leadership appoints ultimately the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and and the you know combatant commanders and so forth, and promotes generals and all. But I would just say a little more about that. People don't, I think they, they got to think Pentagon military and they forget that there's yeah, you know, it civilian really control. Is, <laughs> yeah. It, it's a mistaken notion. And it, it, it's, it's, look, we, we know why, because that is the, the association's Pentagon military uniforms, generals, admirals. But uh, most, if not all, the power is vested in civilians. And certainly with the Secretary of Defense, you have uh, quite a lot of power and authority. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Joint Chiefs themselves, uh, the joint staff, they're all advisors. They, they, they play a functional role uh, providing a military perspective, a military recommendation to their uh, civilian uh, overseers. Uh, so, you know, the, the undersecretary for policy, the undersecretary for research and engineering, they have military people on their staff, but as advisors. And uh, General Milley uh, was my principal advisor. He was also the principal advisor to the president under, under the law and the National Security Council. But they have no authority to deploy troops to make uh, contracting decisions, things like that. Now, I don't mean to downplay that because they have a lot of informal authority, but it's important to understand that the power is, is invested in civilian leaders. That's kind of the form of government that we've developed over 200 plus years that said civilian control of the military matters. And uh, we've, we've, we've uh, hewed strictly to that code. And of course, that developed other norms and, um, and procedures around that to make sure that, that that divide, that respect, that relationship is nurtured. And that was why one of my four no's was don't politicize uh, DOD, the military, because I didn't want that broken down between us. And look, I had a great partner in Mark Milley and, and fortunate that, and people forget this, that he and I had served together for two years in the army. He was chief of staff of the army and I was secretary of the army. So we had built up a rapport that we kind of knew how each other thought about things. We discussed issues all the time. And and so having him by my side, you know, in that role during the tough days, particularly of 2020, uh, was invaluable. And we kind of weathered a lot together during that time. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. And I guess also your relationship with Mike Pompeo, with uh, Gina Haspel and the intelligence community. I mean, say a word about how, how much you all, people think of you as each meeting with the president or, you know, the president presiding over, you know, a, a, something in the sit room, which you see a thick photo, famous photos of, whether it was, was in general, you know, in, in, in the Biden or the Trump administration or every administration. But you all had a huge amount of contact with each other and coordination with each other. Well, you know, when it comes to foreign policy, national security, the power players are state and defense. Uh, you know, if you had to think about uh, another agency just writ large, it would be DOJ and, and Treasury. So those are kind of the, the big four in, in that tiering. You know, CIA was there, uh, not in a policy role, but 
Uh, DOD particularly worked very closely with the CIA. I had a good relationship with Gina Haspel. So many of uh, you know our service members or Special Operations Command in particular worked with her people, a lot of intelligence sharing. So it was a very, very close relationship there. And as you said, with Mike Pompeo, you know, he and I went to West Point together. We were classmates, have a lot of mutual friends. He and I knew each other beforehand. I, I kind of knew where he came from. I, I knew what his what his his uh, uh, true north was, his azimuth. And so we we got along really well. A lot of cooperation between DOD and, and Bill, you know, you know the history of this pretty well. More often than not, there were bad relations between DOD and state. Mm-hmm. You know, you go back to the Weinberger days uh, as, uh, as notable. But uh, Mike and I got along really well. There were times that, you know, he would he would do things that that. Uh, um, uh, that, that that would uh, help out DOD immensely, maybe at the expense, expense of state and, and vice versa. But I thought uh, that was another very important partnership where he could have, he and I could have candid discussions, work well together, came in particularly handy during, you know, um, uh, the, the attacks in late December 2019 against the Shia militia groups. And, and then, of course, the killing of Soleimani. I'm, I'm always reminded of, you know, when our embassy was under siege, Mike Pompeo calling me up and saying, look, I need help here and here. And I said, Mike, you got it. I'm sending in the, the Marines here. I'm going to send in the paratroopers there. Uh, tell your M- ambassador to hold on. You know, help was on the way. And we quickly deployed troops. There was, And these were decisions he and I made together without going to the president, but knowing, of course, the president would fully support it. And, and so having that type of trust and relationship made a big difference. Really brings home how important, though, those senior civilian positions are. And also in terms of just DOD for a second, it's not like the military uh, isn't affected in terms of internal promotions, internal rules and regulations. Of course, those are also under ultimately in civilian control. So a different yeah. kind of secretary of defense responding to a president who's unleashed, so to speak, could really could change things within the military as well as the relations between the political op- uh, uh, officials in the military. Sure. Look, at the end of the day, like for for senior officers that have to go up for Senate confirmation, uh, even for 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 any officer, frankly, they're all subject to confirmation by the Senate. The president can put anybody on that list he wants or pull anybody from that list he wants. And certainly with the most senior folks, I would uh, make sure that it was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or a service, a service chief that uh, I would make my recommendation to the president. I would interview with him uh, once I'd done my interviews. And, but uh, it, it's the president's choice. And I always thought that to be the case. And uh and so a president can pick who, who, who he wants. And so that's another important functioner when you get to that level. And the White House staff, I'm just curious, having been on the White House side of this and in a much lesser role as Vice President Quayle's Chief of Staff, but uh, how intrusive are, can they be into this or do they? Well, you, keep- you, you work there, so you recall. Look, I, look there's a, there is a role for the White House. There, there is a degree of vetting where- That's an unusual it, statement by a sec staff. That's really nice of you to say that. Well, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to balance the equation here in a second. There, there is a role for the White House. It's fine. They're looking at for the pre, out for the president's interests. They're doing a second check. That's fine. I, I, I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, I will not be the first sec staff to complain, as I did oftentimes, and I, as I talk about in my book, of meddling in the internal affairs of the Pentagon, trying to get too involved, particularly from the National Security Council, particularly from the National Security Advisor. Uh, you know, that was that's a constant problem. You know, my view is that the National Security Council staff is too big. It needs to be shrunk down some. But look, at the end of the day, I, my, my sense was always that the administrations that run best are the ones that pick good cabinet secretaries, good deputy secretaries, good top tier people, and let them run their departments consistent with the pre- with what the president has laid out uh, in, in his both his campaign and in his various strategy and policy documents. And when you start getting meddling from the White House, you're really eroding the authority and ability of, 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 this, of the departments to move quickly and effectively to uh, implement the president's agenda. And for staff to be butting in, it's one national security advisor, that's a sort of more of a contest among equals in a certain way. They have the NSC as a role, of course, National Security Council. But I've also was struck, see, even when I was there, and it must have been much more the case when you but under the Trump administration, the, per, the meddling in personnel and junior appointments, the attempt to bring in favorites to do things in jobs that could make a big difference, though, even then. You can't supervise every single thing that happens in some part of the Pentagon that could be quite sensitive, though. I think people don't quite appreciate how, you know, uh, how trick, how risky some of that can be. Yeah. And some of those people on the National Security Council staff are brought in from the agencies. Right. It's a it's a rotation. They come in from state right. or defense or 
the intelligence community. And they, look, they, they, they do a good job, but others are political appointees uh, that are either on NSC or other parts of the White House staff. And that's where it got really tricky with President Trump. You never knew who was going in before you or after you and saying, hey, that's wrong or he's wrong or DOD should do this. Do you do, you know, during the final year, it became very explicit that people in, in the NSC had their own views and, want, and were pushing hard to implement them, despite what defense or defense and state were saying. And sometimes they were outlandish ideas. That's what kind of, again, concerns me when we talk about a second Trump term is not just who will he put at the cabinet departments, but who's going to flesh out the NSC? Who's going to flesh out the White House staff? And those people are there all the time in the White House. And that Oval Office was like a sieve with people going back and forth, talking to the president. That's that was a problem for, uh, you know, that's a problem for any administration because you, you just and, and, you know, Trump, of course, is vulnerable to the last person who put, you know, a bad idea in his head of, of, of moving out with that. And it does seem to me and uh, I've never been a fan of his, but I mean, early on, there was he must have had a sense, maybe more in 2017 than 2019, more in 2019, as you've said, though, than 2020. That you know he doesn't know everything, and he does need some professionals to around him. And he would sometimes, at least, often take their advice or kind of look the other way as you didn't quite do you know things that he had sort of off the cuff ordered you to do or whatever you know. This. But um, uh, and so forth. But it does feel like since 2020, he's that uh, process, let's say, of liber- liberating himself from these different constraints and guardrails. I would call them has accelerated, if anything. It hasn't gone back. He didn't rethink everything after January 6, 2021 and say, you know what? I should have listened to Mike Pence. I should have listened to Mark Esper. I should have listened to Bill Barr. I shouldn't have gone down any of these paths, you know? Well, look, every president learns on a job. I mean, it's there's no training to be president, although, you know, some some have lear- less of a learning curve than others. George, again, H.W. Bush, who, who, who knew D.C., who knew the instruments of government is an example of somebody who had less of a learning curve. So I don't fault a president for learning on the job. Uh, you know, uh, Trump did not take those lessons as well. And look, in many ways, there are things we were recommending pushing back against um, proved to be true. And I, I often wonder whether he looks back and says, you know, thank goodness they were pushing back on me. The, the best example is Afghanistan. I mean, Trump was constantly pushing to get out of Afghanistan, with, withdraw our troops. And as I talk about in the later chapter of my book, uh, you know, in October of 2020, before the election, he's, he's going out there publicly buttressed by his national security advisor saying we need to get out by Christmas, you know, two months away, two and a half months away, which was logistically impossible to do unless you left left everything there and just put soldiers on planes and and left. And we cautioned against that. Uh, I wrote a classified memo at the end of October saying we shouldn't go below 4,500 troops unless the Taliban does this or that or this or that. You know, I've said publicly that I thought we should have um, uh, used military pressure to get them to abide by the agreement. If not, we could have returned forces. But anyway, so the bottom line is we talked him out of a rapid precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan only to see, what, seven, eight, nine, ten months later, Biden do the exact same thing, a, a rapid withdrawal from Afghanistan. The place falls apart. We have 13 brave U.S. service members killed. We have any number of Americans left behind. It was a complete disaster. You know, it, it will it will exceed in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a dismal moment in our foreign policy, what, what we did in Saigon in, what, 75. But we talked Trump out of that. And that was just one example of where I think this staff role is important. And in the second term, the question gets back to, will people be there to talk him out of, uh, out of uh, bad ideas? It, it meant his instincts weren't necessarily wrong to want to get out of Afghanistan. I, in many ways, I shared that view. I talk about it in the book. But how you get out of Afghanistan, under what terms and conditions matters. And that's where the nuance often gets missing. And certainly in the campaign, as you said at the very beginning, we'll make close with this. He, um, you know, he, more, he says what he means usually. He, I think it's fairly, for a politician, is sort of candid in his own way. And he certainly hasn't shown much instinct to go back towards, let's say, the Mark Esper, Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence view of the world and more, more of an instinct to kind of double down on America first and it's different whatever that means, but in, you know, it's different iterations that you're thinking, like the allies, especially. Well, well I've, I, you know, I've said this before. I talk about it in my book. I, I mean, I, and it's I think it's apparent now, right, when you see the polling, there are a lot of Republicans who who want to see Trump re-elect, reelected because it, 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 it uh, they, they recall more favorable times than what they're seeing today. And the Trump administration pursued policy objectives that were consistent with what 
a lot of former conservative Republicans would have pursued as well, right? A, a conservative court, deregulation, lowering of taxes, uh, an aggressive foreign policy. I mean, Trump uh, sought to rebuild the military and, and did so for the first two or three years, um, securing the border, things like that. The challenge was that too often he would go too far, right? Look, I completely agree that we should push the allies in Europe to spend, and Asia, by the way, to spend more on defense, to do more. But you don't go so, so far as to threaten to undermine NATO or to pull out, things like that. So again, I think in many cases, his instincts were right. There were accomplishments during that administration, but he was bound, there were guardrails in place. Guardrail number one being the prospect of reelection, and number two being the people he brought in around him. And um, some of those guardrails won't be there, number two. So Will we get traditional Republican foreign policies or will we get kind of a distorted version of that in, in the second going? I'll let you go. I know you have a plane to catch. I think that second guard was more important personally than the first. The re-election thing, he could tell, tell himself that maybe some of these things would be popular getting out of Afghanistan. I think you all yeah. are, you, you know, you, you don't give yourself and, and your colleagues enough credit for uh, stopping some of these things. And, and then particularly not just bad foreign policy decisions, but the really crucial uh, non-politicization of the military and non-misuse of the military, which again, some of that's beneath the surface, but uh, became pretty obvious once you were you left the Pentagon. What the kinds of things that could happen if they if those the people who succeeded you had been there for a year, not for two months, right? right? What is what is what does that look like? You know, it's, you know so. Mark Esper, um, thank you very much for said for your service to the country, and thank you for joining me here on Conversations. Thanks, Bill. I enjoyed it. Uh, great conversation. So good luck to you and your audience. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And thank you for joining us on Conversations. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Your interest in this program means a lot to me. I appreciate it.